evening to both of you. Thank you so much for your time today. I, the uh, One of the links that Kathy and Scott sent out uh, to all of us was the uh, Voice for the Voiceless YouTube uh, link, and I, I got a chance to watch that. And one of the things that you talked about in there was uh, the biggest challenges is the uh, that wildlife and humans, animals and humans, if we could figure out a way that they can coexist together, we're going to really make some big ground here. And I was wondering if you could share beyond the work that you're doing, because I I got to believe and I know just from reading up about all the work that you do, you're making a huge impact. Who are the other positive deviants out there, whether it's an organization or a uh, a, a regional government or heck even a country that you would point to and say that is the model that we should really be looking at and they are doing it right and you admire them for that hmm. I, i'll say who but you can elaborate okay <laughs> i'm gonna say african parks in rwanda those are the yeah. two things that come to mind for me yeah i'd throw kenya in the mix as well <clears throat> yeah kenya's yeah. up there um yeah, very quickly, African <laughs> Parks was started by an ex-ranger from Kruger National Park in South Africa. And with the now it's grown into an extraordinary organization that uh, major U.S. investors from the Buffets to the Waltons are throwing, uh, you know, nine figures at. Um, uh, just a good, extraordinary amount of money going to these to these organizations like African Parks. And what African Parks has done is that they've worked with governments to say, we'll take on the management of your national park system or, or, or parks, and we will upskill local communities to be the rangers and the protectors of that land, and we can sustain it. And they've developed a business model that allows them to, to do that. Um, and they're now protecting, gosh, I think it's just shy of 23 million hectares across the African continent. Um, so what's that, about 50 million hectares, give or take? It's an extraordinary mm -hmm. amount of land. Um, Rwanda did an extraordinary... Wait, before you move yeah. on, can I just add to that, that part of what they do is they take on the park for a period of time. So it might be 20 years, 25 years, and then the understanding is it goes back to them. So they're coming in, they're rehabilitating, they're, they're setting up the whole infrastructure and then they're giving it back over time when it's ready and self-sustainable. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's, that's quite a big part. So they're, they're not actually buying the land. So all the money that they're, they're raising is going into that infrastructure and the jobs and, and, and people, moving yeah. animals back on land where maybe they were all killed and then lots of security. Yeah. So that's an extraordinary organization that Shan mentioned Rwanda as well, which I think is a great example. So you look at sort of Rwanda, Congo, um, CAR, uh, just the most heinous history. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, also became a democratic state in 94, the same as South Africa. And what they did there was that they took a very patient approach they had this sense of pride being instilled in saying that our meal ticket to the world uh, is our wildlife and our wild places. And so they, they developed this extraordinary culture. And to give you an idea, one week, one day a week, every week, led by the, by the president himself, the entire country stops and you walk outside and you pick up trash. To this day, Plastic, they still do that. Trash, so yeah. you can drive around Kigali, capital of Rwanda, and you will not see one cigarette butt, one plastic bag, nothing on the street. Uh, cleaner than Cape Town, cleaner than Johannesburg, cleaner than LA, cleaner than New York, cleaner than Alaska. I literally. believe you're not actually even allowed <clears throat> to fly in with like plastic Ziploc bags. You can't yeah. fly in with those. They will take them from you at the airport. So they developed this incredible, uh, this incredible pride in protecting their their natural surrounds, and so that gave them an opportunity to grow the habitat for the mountain gorilla, which is the backbone of their tourism industry, and that has grown in leaps and bounds. And we've seen major, major tourism operators investing hundreds of millions of dollars into that area. And where they had poachers before have become the rangers. So the guys that were going out and killing gorilla are now the guys leading you on a conservation tour, 
saying I was wrong. Help me fix what we did in the past. And by being here and learning and understanding, you're doing that. Uh, Kenya, um, interesting, and, and Frank, to, to our discussion as well, this is an interesting one. Um, Kenya didn't hang about with the debates of, do we trade ivory? Do we stockpile rhino horn? Do we um, you know, invest into the trophy hunting industry? They said that that debate is counterproductive to our need and the urgency to crack on and create meaningful socioeconomic change. And so what they did was that they said, no more trade in, in any animal part, forget it. They took literally tens of thousands of tons of rhino horn and, and ivory, and they burnt and crushed the lot. They said, we will not even have the, 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 the attraction or the temptation of trading in these illicit goods. And they said, right, we are going to build our tourism economy around leasehold agreements, around community engagement. And although I can tell you now it ain't perfect, it's a long way from perfect. They've got huge problems, make no mistake, but everybody does. But what they've been able to do is that they've stuck to their guns and I respect them for that. And in the last three years, it's the one of the very few, I think one of maybe three countries on the African continent that can boast that they are growing their elephant and rhino number and there hasn't been one reported poaching incident as a result. So when we take economic control of the opportunity for our people, we mitigate the risk of having very underhanded, corrupt dealings in an illicit trade. And when you do that and you commit to it in less than a generation, you can put your country on an incredible trajectory. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the, the world respects Kenya. If you wanna go on safari and you walk into most safari operators in the States, they'll say Kenya. It's safe, it's abundant, South Africa, violent, horrible. It impacts it. And and just to add to that, they, they have the Maasai tribe there that traditionally the Maasai would kill lions. So if a, if, if a lion came and took one of their sheep or their cows, they would retaliate and go kill the lion. And they have come to an agreement with them to not do that and to do certain compensations once a full investigation has been done, if something is taken or lost, if that investigation says, yes, it was done by a lion, they will compensate them so that they don't go retaliate. And that's made a big difference as well. All right, we're gonna go to a speed round here. We've got cool. 